Christ is risen. Christos Anesti. Christos Voskres. Amen. That's what it's all about. Uh, it really is a blessing to be here with y'all. Uh, I'm not Bishop Daniel. His accent's a little bit different. <laughs> he's an excellent presenter. If you ever have an opportunity to spend time with him, he's very charismatic. And this is really his passion, doing humanitarian work right now in Ukraine. But he's just called to serve the Lord and the Lord's people. And uh, it's wonderful to be around him because it's contagious. His enthusiasm really is contagious. And uh, we're really blessed by his witness. Um, and, you know, that's why he's not here right now is because he's actually doing the work. So uh, I get to be uh, Luke, <laughs> right? Who, who said that earlier? He said that, didn't he? So um, I'd like to begin by saying, yes, I, I am um, a professor. I teach at St. Sophia's. Um, that means I've read a lot of books. I am a retired intelligence officer, so I have some experience in that. But I want to warn you that I'm not really approaching this from those directions, not even as a political analyst who studies Ukraine. Um, I'm really coming at this as a priest and as a pastor because in my work, as a priest, just for the last eight years, I am learning how to do humanitarian work. Okay, Woonsocket, Rhode Island, is not a dangerous place, not in the same way that, you know, many of the places that y'all work are, but there are people in need, and it's my calling not just to help them myself, but I, I, I lead an NGO, <laughs> a an organization, and I'm the only paid person, and I have a hundred volunteers, and we're supposed to change the world. Okay. And that really is how I approach my position. So when I speak to you about humanitarianism and orthodoxy and what's going on in Ukraine, I want you to understand that it is more informed by my work as a pastor and in my face-to-face, -face, you know, human touch contact with people in need and also with someone who immerses himself as much as possible in the worship of the Orthodox Church. Those are my two biggest theological influences right now. And I, I say this as a warning because I, uh, I'm a dilettante when it comes to academics, okay? So one of my areas of interest is uh, political psychology and moral psychology. And one of the findings, pretty robust findings there, is that when we make moral decisions, our, our cognitive minds really aren't involved until after the fact. It's our instincts that are providing the decisions, and then our active minds come along kind of as cheerleader to explain why it was the obvious thing to do. Are you familiar with this? I'm really not making it up, okay? This is a, a pretty robust finding in psychology. So what that suggests is that we have to be very careful and very humble when we make our decisions, when we present them as authoritative. Okay? So that is why I'm warning you. Um, I believe that what I'm going to present has been informed mostly by my work as a priest, as a pastor, and as a liturgist. But, you know, to paraphrase Dickens, it could be the soup that I had last night. So, you know, you just need to be aware of that. Okay? And this brings me into another thing that I think is, is kind of important, and this is the psychology of, of moral decision-making, the psychology of, of, uh, of doing good work. Um, there is a difference between us in the West and the rest of the world, okay? And you've heard it called weird, probably, and I'm not going to summarize that work. But within moral psycho psychology, one of the interesting findings is that, um, and this I'm re relying largely on the work of people like Jonathan Haidt, and he did empirical work to look at what the moral thinking was like among different people. And what he found was there are some universal moral categories that everyone considers important. We may not agree on how to apply them, but we all agree that they're important. And, and the two primary ones that we all agree on, these are the ones, 
are don't do harm to people, and if it's possible, do good. Okay? Everyone agrees on that. Glory to God that this is built in, and, and the fall hasn't taken that from us. And then the second one that, that we all share is equality. This is when we find common cause, this is often the, the you know, lowest common denominator of our work. But as Orthodox, we offer more. Our morality is broad spectrum. The fullness of the faith offers so much more than that. Um, and to use, um, you know, Haidt's work, uh, we have concepts like sanctity that inform our ability to bring aid to people, to help them become more human. We have concepts like, um, like loyalty, and concepts like purity and authority that resonate with us and that allow us to be humanitarian in a very special way and in a more complete way. Okay, but that's not what I want to talk to you about tonight. <laughs> what I want to start with, following the example of his eminence, is from the beginning. Right? In the beginning. <laughs> Let's take stock. We have a world that groans in agony. It chews people up. I see it in Woonsocket, I saw it in Afghanistan. You see it everywhere you go. It divides them, it deprives them, it hurts them, and it does its best to take away their hope. It demeans and tries to dehumanize them. We have all seen this and we are here because we want to do a better job helping all the world's casualties, victims, and collaborators. One of our problems is that this world has done a number on us as well. And honestly, this hampers our ability to help. And it does this in ways that are obvious, but also some that are more subtle. You see, we ourselves are victims and collaborators with the world. We ourselves need healing. We need the ability to absolve and distance ourselves from evil. This is not easy, but by the grace of God, bringing comfort and succor to others works every side of this problem. Let me explain by going to the beginning, and I mean this literally. Again, the world groans in Aggie. This is from Romans. And it is so much the realm of the evil one and has been so perverted by the effects of sin that Christ himself, along with the Apostle Paul and St. John the Theologian, used the, world world, used the word world or cosmos as a stand-in for wickedness. And all those who yoke themselves to it this is what the world means in some theological context. But we have to remember that this was not always the case. One of the fundamental truths that is taught in Genesis 1 is that creation was very good in the beginning and that humanity was created as its very good steward. As its steward made in the image of God, Humanity was given both power and responsibility. The power was that creation was blessed by its presence and blessed by its attention. The responsibility was to care for creation as God himself would care for it, as God himself did and does. The world was designed to respond to humanity and humanity was designed to be an ontological blessing to the world. But what did we do? We failed in our responsibility. We decided to represent ourselves rather than God and we fell from grace. As a result of this, our ability to bless the world was compromised. It still responds to us, but we have to admit that we are as much a curse to this world and even the people we try to help as we are a blessing 
oftentimes. Genesis 3, especially 17, 19, describes how we became a curse to the world. In response to us, it would offer up brambles and we would have to work hard for every scrap of bread. Even the miracle of new life itself would be accomplished only with pain. Now it is the accumulation of such curses, both intentional and unintentional, that makes the world groan in agony. It is this accumulation that makes those of us who live here look forward to a better time. And please note here that humanity itself is part of creation. It is part of the cosmos. We do not just hurt the world like, you know, poisoning a garden or something when we sin. We further damage humanity itself. The results of this downward spiral are obvious to everyone with eyes to see and with ears to hear. Now, please don't un misunderstand me. It is not that all people, hopefully even any people, <laughs> mean to damage the world and cause harm to others. It seems to me that most people, most of the time, are just trying to do their best, given their circumstances and their understanding of those circumstances. But the facts of Genesis 3 cannot be ignored. Even when we do something that seems good, there are consequences. What economists and political scientists call negative externalities that cause harm. Every action we make in this world is a compromise. Everything we do is bound up in sin. Nothing we do is perfect in every consequence. Everything misses the mark in one way or another. Now, if I'm exaggerating to make a point, it's not by much. I can only imagine just maybe a handful of things we can do in this world that do not bring up spiritual or material brambles along with the good fruit that we desire. To paraphrase Romans 7:18, I have the will to do good within me, but I just cannot get it done. Now here, the Apostle Paul is mainly speaking about the way imperfect understanding and the flesh hamper his efforts. But even a perfect intellect would find it all but impossible to do unmitigated good without completely first remaking the world, which, of course, is the very plan of the perfect intellect, the Logos. So what is the solution? We can't be left in despair. What I've described is the dilemma that post-Genesis 3 humanity is stuck in. Humanity has been damaged and dehumanized, but when we try to fix this condition, or even lessen its most severe effects, we are hindered by our own compromised humanity. It is impossible, so to speak, to lift one's up, oneself up by one's bootstraps, except maybe in the very short term. The Old Testament diagnoses this problem, then offers the coming of the God Messiah as the remedy. He would be the one that would bring life to the cursed desert lands and healing to the wounded. I want to read you a bit of just one example of the kind of poetry that the Old Testament presents to us as we try to understand. And this is from Isaiah 35. And it's best understood, I'm not going to read you the whole Bible, but it's best understood if we also read 34 about what curses really look like. But this from Isaiah 35, 410. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. 
and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay, shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, the fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Now, that's a long passage, but I want you to get a sense of the hopeful expectation. Okay, the imagery is, you know, the dry lands are always, you know, the, uh, an example of, of like a cursed place, a place that's desolate and devoid of any kind of um, hope or life. When the Lord says that he will bring water to those lands, he's bringing a cure to the world's ills. Jesus Christ is the new Adam, the new human, if I may be so bold. So I'm going to play a little bit with this word humanitarian and humanitarianism. We haven't done that much today. He is the one who has the effect on creation that the old Adam perverted, but who has it in infinite abundance as well. Grace flows from him like a fountain. His living water nourishes and blesses everyone and everything in his presence. When we put away the old man in favor of the new, when we put on Christ through baptism and every other mystery of the church, we are restoring our own relationship with creation and our ability to minister to one another. The implications for humanitarian work are amazing. But wait, there's more. In seminary, it's really hard to teach people everything at once, right? So what we do is we segment it and we systematize theology. It's just a product of, of the you know, pedagogy and, and the way classes are taught. When we teach what I just presented you at St. Sophia's, we call it the spirituality of theophany. The psalms and hymns of theophany describe how evil and corruption flee from the presence of Christ in the water and how he blesses the water and imbues it with grace. Remember those wonderful words that we say over and over again through those services. The Jordan turned back. But despite how we teach it, the theology and spirituality of theophany cannot really be separated from everything else that is good and true. When we see and celebrate the mystery of theophany along with the mystery of the church, the ramifications for our ministry of healing, humanitarianism, become especially strong. If we look, when we look at the Old Testament and when we study scholarship of it, we see that there is a close association between the Messiah, the Christ, and Israel. And, you know, some theologians, non-Orthodox theologians, they get caught up about whether a given piece of scripture is prophetically talking about Israel or talking about the Messiah, as in the disagreements about how to interpret the beautiful suffering servant passages of Isaiah. But these kind of arguments obscure a more fundamental reality. The Messiah and his people Israel are meant to be together. This reality is perfectly realized in the relationship between Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and his body, the church. This corporate reality that has been created means that it isn't just that every human has the opportunity to restore his and her relationship with others and with creation, but that this opportunity is offered for the restoration of the human race to put it another way, Christ, the new Adam, is not just the new human, but the head of the restored and grace-filled new humanity. So 
What are the implications for humanitarian work? And I am going to get to Ukraine. I'm going to use Ukrainian examples from His Grace uh, Bishop Daniel's ministry as I get to specific points. There is a common adage that you cannot offer others something you yourself do not have. Of course, this is true. And we must have resources and skills if we hope to provide food, if we hope to clothe, and if we hope to train others. But there's a more fundamental truth here. We must become human if we are to help restore the broken humanity of others. The new Adam is the one who is truly dignified, and it is in him and through him that the dignity of others can be most fully realized. How do we do that? How do we join the body of the new Adam? My plan here is to leave aside the formal requirements, the things that are most commonly taught in catechism class and so on, in favor of the work that we must do and with which this colloquium is most concerned. I will then provide examples from the humanitarian work of Vladika Daniel and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the USA. The first point is that if we want to become human so that we can provide humanitarian aid to others, we must help those in need. It's not optional. Jesus Christ summed up, as has been expressed so many times, I love it when people quote the Bible, the requirements of the good life is one given over to the love of God and the love of neighbor. And he spells out that the love of neighbor he does this not just in the parable of the Good Samaritan, but in his comparison of the life and rewards of the good versus evil servant in St. Matthew 25. We are required to feed the hungry, to give water to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit those in prison, and so on. It is through that kind of canonic service that we become more human. Do you see the wonderful economics of this? <laughs> we become more human, more like the new Adam, as we heal and help others. And that dynamic doesn't just stop there. Before we, I talked about a downward spiral, this is the opposite. Those who are touched by the healing grace of the new Adam are then called to join him in bringing comfort and healing to others. Instead of a downward spiral, we have the opportunity to, to participate in a dynamic that sweeps all of creation up in its motion. That motion won't be completed here and now, although we will see its first fruits. Many of you already have. But it certainly will be completed in the age to come. Let me give you an example of this from Vladika Daniel's ministry. For 15 years, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the USA has supported orphanages for orphans that were affected by the radiation from the Chernobyl disaster. His Grace Bishop Daniel has been the energy and the organizer behind this effort for as long as I've known him, for at least a decade. In addition to this, our St. Andrew's Society works with soup kitchens and aid organizations on the ground, like Logos in Ukraine, to provide services that the economy and government has not, for whatever reason. We also provide direct aid to support hospitals and wounded veterans. I'll speak more on that in a moment, in a different context. The second requirement for us, if we are to become human so that we might restore the humanity of others, is that if we want to be human, we have to deal directly with others. Everything is done in relationship. If we were to try and distill the salvific word of Jesus Christ to a set of transactions, this happens all too often will miss out on the reality of his work. For instance, you will run into theologians who will argue about what the most important act of Christ was. 
They'll argue about whether the essence of the economy of salvation is to be found in his blameless offering on the cross. Others want to argue that it's the necessity of the resurrection. And others would focus attention on his very incarnation. But salvation, that is to say, the raising up of fallen humanity to the status of heirs of the kingdom of God is a holistic act. And we lack the ability to understand it in its fullness, much less the ability to play intellectual Jenga with all of its parts. For instance, to the point here, it is silly to imagine Jesus Christ living in isolation from his people. It was love that drove him to empty himself for us. And that love assumes and requires personal interaction. His healing ministry was done in the community of others. And it was done in intimate contact with them. Now those that know the Bible and the life of Jesus Christ will say, wait, he also did it at a distance. Yes, but even then there were intercessors. It was still personal. It was still done face to face. Face to face conversations sharing food at the same table and providing a comforting touch and healing ministrations with our own hands is so much more powerful than delegating it to sterile bureaucracies and their SOPs. As I was preparing to take Vladika Daniel's place at this conference, I was overwhelmed by the knowledge that I had never done humanitarian work outside this country. The closest I had ever come was providing full-time intelligence support to the counterinsurgency and rebuilding efforts in Afghanistan. You'll have to admit that's a rather dubious comparison to the kind of work that you and that he are doing. All of my truly charitable work has been serving the communities in and around the parishes that I serve. For instance, working in soup kitchens, teaching life skills to the homeless, visiting the sick, the elderly, the grieving, the imprisoned, and running a food pantry out of our rectory. But if we are to take this point seriously, and I think we have to, we also have to recognize that all of this is local whether it's in Ukraine, whether it's in Kenya, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's face to face, it's local. Let me give you some good examples from Vladika Daniel's ministry about this face to face and the power of it. The, our, our church, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the USA, we do send necessities to the three orphanages that we support. Okay, we send them diapers, which is always in short supply, you know, all, all the kinds of things we need, and, and money. But we also send mission teams, and Bishop Daniel leads these teams. At the end of each of the grueling day, and those days are hard, Bishop Daniel meets with his missionaries, and he draws out of them how they were affected by their ministry to these people with such broken bodies, massaging them, touching them, carrying them, and what it did to the people that they were serving. How it made them, the missionaries, more human. And then he brought it out and said that this is the kind of sacrificial love and service that is required of everyone. And about how it enables the least of these we are commanded to help to feel the human touch of love. Now the children's regular caregivers love the children. Of course they do. But these orphanages 
are understaffed continually. And so they have to do what has to get done. And things like massaging the back, singing with them, carrying them so that they can go outside and play, don't happen as often as the caregivers themselves would like. They're just overwhelmed. But the missionaries are able to bring the compassion of Christ to each of the afflicted children. These people then come home having seen the good that this does to the children and the good that it has done in their own lives. And then they share in that enthusiasm with their friends and parishes. The third requirement that I'd like to discuss is that to be human is to work towards the restoration of unity. See, humanity is meant to have a corporate identity. The Messiah provides the way to restore the unity that was fractured in the garden and that was institutionalized at the destruction of the Tower of Babel when we were divided into nations. Through him, all can be gathered into a single people with him as their head. As Saints Peter and Paul, echoing Deuteronomy 10, put it, God is not a respecter of persons. I love preaching on that. People think they're di you're dissing them, but we're not. God does not respect persons. He loves everyone. <laughs> there are two implications that I would like to cover, both witnessed to by Christ's ministry and the ministry of his apostles. The first implication I'd like to cover is that we, we, we are required to help the broken person God puts into our path, even if he is not like us. This has been a continual theme today. Again, the Good Samaritan provides a starting point. We do not only help people like us or people from whom we expect to receive reward, but we are to help those that our culture has taught us we should ignore or despise. Christ is very straightforward with this, even associating it with the way it helps to restore our own humanity. This is a quote. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the ground, uh, to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those that love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans do the same. If you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which in is in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5. The command to love our enemies is a difficult one. Most people have a problem even loving their in-laws. Those who think it's easy, I don't think they've ever met an enemy face to face. They have theoretical enemies, <laughs> like ISIS in America. I, will deal, I want to deal with one of the subtler challenges of loving your enemy later. But the challenge is clear. We have to help those in need, period. After all, what does the Logos have in common with us? And yet he makes every sacrifice so that we might be healed. The second implication is that we should work together to bring healing to our neighbor. We shouldn't just work with those who look or talk like us, but with everyone who has a desire to serve. At times, the logistics and practicalities of this can seem to make it even more difficult than loving our enemies. After all, it's, quite, it's one thing to help someone, and it's quite another to work with them. This kind of action often has great potential for unintended consequences. 
So sussing those out has to be done. The risks have to be weighed. And if you think that this is unbiblical or unchristian to weigh the risks, I'm afraid that you may be wrong. Because, Saint, because Christ in the gospel as presented by St. Matthew in chapter 10 gives that kind of advice when he's sending his disciples out to change the world. He says that they need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And that's in the context of finding allies in their ministry. The mutual work that we propose to encourage with this symposium carries little danger and so many compelling benefits. Most notably, we witness to the unity God desires when we do this together. We grow in the unity that God desires. And we do the kind of work God requires more efficiently. Let me give you some examples of, and in the session after when I finish, I'd love to hear your examples of times when this kind of coordination has really uh, led to disaster and also led to great blessings. I've seen both. First, I'll share with you some examples from Vladika Daniel's ministry. It is true. This is a knock that is often made against the Greek church and the Ukrainian church in America, that a lot of our aid effort, maybe even most of our aid effort, focuses on serving people in Ukraine. But even in that, we are following the spirit of Christ's command because we are serving people from whom we could never expect anything in return. These orphans may live in Ukraine, but what does a deformed child have to pay us back with? Well, you know the answer. I mean, their love <laughs> and transformation. But that's not the kind of transaction that Christ is warning us against. Homeless people in Ukraine are never going to pay us back. Wounded veterans, either. And Vladika Daniel has even noticed how much he has changed since coming to America. <laughs> he loves Ukraine, and he loves Ukrainians. But he has given himself over completely to the role of a bishop of the Orthodox Church here in America. The service ethnic churches in America provide to their native homelands should not be discounted because of the love the providers have for their old countries and people, especially when they sacrifice resources that could be used to build up their own communities and people more like them, in this case, Ukrainian Americans. The sacrifices are real. The love is real. And it really bothers me when people demean it and belittle it. One local example of answering the call to find allies outside of one's tribe, and this is truer and truer among our ethnic churches here, is that the UOC USA does not just serve or ordain Ukrainians or Ukrainian Americans to ministry. I'm a product of the truth that my bishops do not respect persons when it comes to selecting ministers. In addition, our ethnic parishes are full of people who have little or no ethnic heritage. Let me give you a more, an example you're more interested in. <laughs> uh, has to do with, with Ukrainian politics, and I'm going to be very careful. If you want follow-up questions, I'll be happy to answer them. We may turn off the camera. <laughs> You can see the willingness of His Eminence Metropolitan Antony and His Grace Daniel to take risks, building alliances, demonstrating the unity of God in their recent work in Ukraine. The ecclesiastical divisions among the Orthodox in Ukraine are sharp and they're very painful. There are recent memories terrible memories of betrayal, of abuse, some of it quite personal. While the war has raised the emotional stakes, the war in Ukraine, 
it has also underscored the need to witness God's desire that we be one as He is one. Few people, me especially, would not have guessed in a million years that I would see a picture of His Eminence, Metropolitan Antoni, standing next to His Holiness Patriarch Philaret of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Kievan Patriarch. Okay. But if you look on the UFC USA website, it's there right after pictures and press releases of all the religious groups of Ukraine, plus Metropolitan Antonio and Bishop Daniel, who have a special relationship there, meeting with the president of Ukraine. Again, this kind of thing carries tremendous risks. But it came about because of the great need to work for peace and unity by being peaceful, by being united, at least as united as canonical restraints allow. These meetings, in turn, helped further prepare the way for the ecclesiastical and Eucharistic unity, hopefully, <laughs> between two of Ukraine's Orthodox churches, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Kievan Patriarchate and the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church neither whom are part of, you know, canonical world orthodoxy. Lord willing, this kind of reunion, this kind of healing of very painful wounds would serve as a stepping stone, to mix metaphors, towards bringing these two groups into communion with world orthodoxy. This is our hope. Such relationships, and you can imagine similar things in your own ministries, have to be treated carefully so as not to scandalize the weak and to avoid the possibility of being dragged into the darker corners of local politics that an outsider can never understand. Similarly, we, like the rest of you who do such work, have learned some of the dangers of working with local and national governments. I mention this because of the meeting with the, of the religious leaders of Ukraine with President Poroshenko. Corruption has been mentioned before, and other inefficiencies lessen the amount of time and aid that can be shared. And the association that is demonstrated with politicized leaders can make it more difficult for aid groups and religious leaders to stay above the fray and be a unifier and bridge builder, or even a provider of aid. These, combined with the wonderful effects of personal face-to-face -face ministry, are why humanitarians like Vladika Daniel prefer, prefer to provide aid themselves. He prefers to go straight to the hospital, straight to the wounded soldier, straight to the hurt children, and share what we had gathered here to help them. You know how association, association with size groups can ruin your ability to provide aid. I saw this dynamic from a different view in Afghanistan. One of the things that we were trying to do, part of the COIN strategy, was to provide a safe place where civil society and all the normal parts of normal life could be rebuilt. And it's NGOs that had to drive that bus. And we had to provide a safe place. Ideally, we would coordinate but we had to be very careful. Why? Because you did not want to taint someone. Because there are people who hate coalition forces in Afghanistan. And you can ruin their ability to serve. They know that. <laughs> and we knew that. So we had to be very careful. And this is, you know, it's kind of like an easy out. I, I, I do this in my local ministry. If, if the government tells me that if I want to run a soup kitchen, I have to get, you know, all this kind of extra zone code stuff, we're not going to do it. We're going to invite people over for dinner, and we're going to be very quiet about it. Or we're going to open up a food pantry. Sometimes it's better to go after the lower hanging fruit. The next point is that being human means loving your enemy. 
Loving your enemy is hard when your enemy is causing obvious harm to the people that you are dedicated to serving. I mentioned this earlier in the context of helping those outside our groups, but I want to treat a subtler dimension of this now. One of my most interesting jobs for the intelligence community was helping to diagnose why we messed up with 9-11 and why we committed the opposite kind of error with WMD in Iraq. And so there was a lot of navel-gazing, and it turns out that we, all of us, individually and collectively, are set up for failure when it comes to understanding, much less forecasting, political and military events. Unfortunately, we don't suddenly find rationality when the domain changes to things like moral decision-making. And this makes it hard for us to live the kind of life that Christ has called us to. When you love someone, you are long-suffering towards their actions, and you are charitable towards their intentions. In our fallenness, we are not wired to be empathetic towards our enemies. We are continually tempted to dehumanize and demonize them. Moreover, our selection of enemies, so-called, is not just or often even primarily driven by events. It's like much of our moral decision-making. It's often visceral and precognitive with what scientists call the slow or system two, to use Kahneman's term, coming along later to provide post hoc arguments for why these people really are our enemies. Moreover, this process happens in such a way that we actually believe that our identification of them as enemies was done completely by reason and really is justified. The ability to create images, avatars, icons of others within our minds and to love them in our hearts, even when apart, is one of the greatest gifts that we've been given. It allows us to work well and serve others, serve with others, by giving us the ability to anticipate their concerns and anticipate their needs. But how we use such gifts is important. Too often, we have to admit that we use this ability to keep others in our mind and to create avatars of them in our imaginations to stage kind of puppet shows with our imagine <laughs> with our the people who we have designated as enemies as the villains and us as the righteous do-gooders moreover oftentimes we don't just replay what they have done wrong in the past we actually create new scenario scenarios to further justify our malice this is what we call forecasting. Now, I'm not so naive to believe that there are no dangerous people with wicked intentions in the world. Of course there are. But motives are funny things. We consistently overestimate the role of intention in other people's actions while underplaying the role of the situation and circumstances, while doing the opposite for ourselves and our instinctively selected allies. This is the subtle effect of pride. This is why it's so hard for us to love. Moreover, it is next to impossible to get the kind of objective data that would allow us to make rational decisions about who is really responsible for a given action and to understand why they did it. As an intelligence analyst, I had incredible resources I was an all-source analyst. I could look at all of our gathered information, but I couldn't free myself from my prejudices, and neither could anyone else. The information was enough, not a, never enough. It was often conflicting. It was impossible for us to be able to understand what was really going on. I'm not exaggerating by much. 
this should create within all of us a strong sense of humility about our ability to judge others and especially their intentions. We have to be humble when we try to discern why people do what they do. Love requires it, and love requires charity. What might this mean for humanitarian work? It seems to me that it provides another reason to help people with our own hands. We seek out and we serve those who have been damaged by the world. We recognize the hurt. Pain is evil to, easy to see. Even when we don't understand its causes. There is little need to place blame when we are healing with our own hands. It's only when we move towards advocating political solutions that the proper placing of blame becomes important to us as humanitarians. Unfortunately, that is also when it is most difficult to be objective. When it comes to this, this kind of advocacy work, only those with great or very little Humility have the ability to think rationally and to place blame objectively. I'd like to conclude with two, I think there might be more controversial points. Um, I've brought these up in uh, ecumenical work. I work with the uh, Council of Churches in things like the Faith and Order and we deal with topics like poverty and stuff. And, you know, I'm always the uh, uh, odd one out there. The first point goes back to the idea of us as part of the new humanity, the body of Christ. One of the signs that Jesus was the Messiah was his miraculous healing ministry. He was the one through whom the world was made, the one who created humanity. He was the omnipotent one incarnate as man. He emanated grace continually. But even so, he did not heal everyone. His healing ministry back then was not just designed to bring relief to those relatively few people who were healed. His purpose was also pedagogical designed to demonstrate that he was the God-man Messiah and how his work should be done. As part of the body of Christ, we have to recognize that we cannot comfort and heal everyone. You can't. We also have to know that this in no way diminishes the importance of our work. Heaven forbid, do we really think that we are better than the Messiah, Christ Jesus. That work is not just about bringing help to those in need. It is about restoring humanity and preparing the world to take part in the great restoration that is to come. My second point, and this one I, I still struggle with, it's harder for me to express and it's the most likely to be misunderstood. I know this because people have almost thrown things at me when I bring it up. I don't know how widespread this is, but among many people that I work with um, or talk politics with, we increasingly behave as though we believe that people cannot have dignity while they are poor or while they are suffering from inhuman, inhumane conditions. By this, and I'm, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but all of the effort of, not, of many groups is simply to lift people up in order to make them more human. One of the things that orthodoxy offers is the ability to bring joy and comfort to someone regardless of their circumstances. This is what the way of 
the ascetic life is about. It's the ability to sustain contentment, to sustain hope, the knowledge of self-worth, no matter what your circumstances are. It seems to me that this is something that the world needs to hear. I don't know how we get it to them, but if we keep this light under a bushel, I know that we'll be judged for it. We have the tools not just to feed them, but to allow them to be invulnerable to the world. And I think we really are responsible for bringing that kind of strength to those who have been hurt. So here we have come full circle and to the end of my talk. We restore the dignity and humanity of the victimized and the dehumanized by loving them, by serving them, by treating them as persons made in the image of God. Through this, we are perfected. We become more human. But through this, they are reminded that as sons and daughters of God, they should be loved. This is one of the most powerful gifts that our ministry offers to us, is the ability to change lives through the application of love, by looking someone in the eyes, by spending time with them, time that no one else has ever spent with them. I know that your eminence has done that. You've seen how people respond to that kind of sacrifice. It's never been done for them before. And when you do it, they know Christ in a way that they could never learn from a book. So I think this is our calling.